as all of you may have noticed, I have given everyone the opportunity to open up their mic to unmute themselves. Um, so be aware that you have the ability to join the conversation at any time. And you can also have the opportunity to turn on your video as well if you'd like to. All right, so let's get things kicked off. I'm Tracy, I'm the marketing manager here at Amplify and I am so happy that all of you could join us today. Um, we are talking today about gaining leadership buy-in around data governance and we're joined by two people that are very well well known in, <laughs> in our spaces as far as data governance is concerned. Um, we've got Allison Taft, who is the VP of customer success here at Amplify. And we have Sean Connolly, who is the strategic uh, strategy principal of strategic services at Precisely. Um, so this conversation is going to be a virtual boardroom. We're going to all communicate and join the conversation. Um, however, don't feel like you don't have to if you don't want to. Um, these two here have a lot to, to talk about as far as data governance is concerned to begin with. So I'm going to take the opportunity to just kick it off with Sean and let him intro and let's get things started. Oh, let's take a moment. Um, I know I have a couple of people that already have their mics uh, allowed. If you'd like to take an opportunity to introduce yourself, um, like who you are, what company you come from, a little bit about your background um, and what, so we know a little bit about each other so we can have this conversation. So you want me to start? Yes, Sean, please. <laughs> Great. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, so I'm Sean Conley, and I look after um, international strategic services for, uh, for Precisely. Um, I have a background in high-tech manufacturing and worked for Apple, HP, a bunch of computer companies. Um, I've owned companies. I uh, have pretty much worked internationally for about 15 years, living in Copenhagen, Denmark. So I've kind of worked with companies from near and far, um, kind of around data processes and uh, data transformations, um, data science, business intelligence, um, and really for the past few years been focused on really let's get the data good because um, I kind of got tired of paying people a lot of money to find data, integrate data, clean data, and that kind of thing. So um, really it's about, you know, how do we make that data good? Um, and I think most importantly, how do we tie that to the objectives of the organization so that we're focused on the right things and delivering value for the enterprise? So um, Kind of like Tracy said, except I would say you kind of have to talk. It's a small crowd, and this is a little bit of a boardroom situation. So, you know, we really don't have any slides prepared or that. I can pull some things up if somebody's got a specific question, or if nobody asks any questions, I'll tell you that you will start to see some slides. <laughs> so that's who I am, and uh, glad to be here. Thank you, Sean. Uh, so I'm going to keep mine quick because I believe most of the people on this call already know me, but I'm Allison Taft. As Tracy said, I do own client success for Amplify, did start as a consultant. So I have been through many implementations and I've done a lot of strategy and data governance work. Um, that said, I'm really happy to see some familiar faces on this call. Sean and I did participate in an Avanta Gartner event in Dallas a couple of weeks back, which is where we got the idea for this event. It was super productive. So I'm gonna echo Sean's call for everyone to share. I think the most beneficial point of this is learning from each other. Uh, we have at least three really great organizations represented on this call. And I know that your challenges are all unique, but there are a lot of similarities there as well. So with that said, I am going to prompt Cheryl, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself to the crowd, I'd, I'd love to get things started and, and have the conversation start with you. Good morning. Um, I don't know where my camera is on the Zoom, sorry. You're still in your pajamas, come on. No. <laughs> um, so I'm Cheryl Gilmore and I am with the Mac Volvo North America Truck Organization. And I am the product owner for our new PIM solution. We are close to go live. And so with that, um, comes the challenge of data governance. So I'm very aware that uh, we need to get this started. <laughs> and, you know, I really have no experience with it and it's new to our organization. And um, yeah, you know, I've done some research, but definitely welcome any advice, tips, tricks. So we're just starting our journey and need 
to learn. Tips, tricks, and ditches. <laughs> Thank you, Cheryl. And with that, I'm going to now prompt Debbie and Avinash to introduce themselves, uh, as I know that I lived through the very painful go live with you guys and some of the data challenges that Cheryl's facing as they go live today. So Debbie, let's start with you, um, and then Avinash, if you would follow on. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Debbie Dirks, and I work for Starbucks Coffee, and I run the data management, um, data, data product data governance program. Gosh, it's 7 a.m. here. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I can't really talk. Uh, so you need some coffee. I, I have some right by my side here. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm, I manage the product data governance program um, for product at Starbucks. And it's a fairly new program. And I had the opportunity to spend a few days with Allison and other um, Amplify members and, and Precisely members last week for a two-day workshop. And um, I really just want to hear what everyone else has to say this morning. Thank you. Great. Right. Thanks, Abby. Uh, hi, team. Uh, my name is Avinash. I'm a principal technical product manager in the Starbucks technology team. Uh, my team supports uh, the product data platforms that Starbucks owns, Interbo Interworks being one of them. And uh, for me, kind of my team works very closely with Debbie uh, to kind of manage all the product data. And we are kind of very uh, curious to know about the, the challenges that uh, that we are facing across the industry and like what are the best uh, like uh, <clears throat> standards that, that other folks are following and really interested to hear uh, from Alison, you and Sean. Uh, just around the data governance thought process and the aspect that we have in today. Awesome. Thank you, Avinash and Debbie. And then lastly, Ruthie, I believe you are the only person on this call, um, sorry, Suzanne, <laughs> that I don't know. So if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself to the group, I'd love to hear more about you and your role. I'm from NewPig. We've been live um, for about um, six, seven months. Um, so, and I'm very interested in data governance and want to hear what everyone else. Um... Awesome. So I think that everyone here is probably facing challenges with data governance from my understanding of both where Matt Volvo and Starbucks are, uh, Cheryl, I think we are experiencing a lot of challenges with just getting the data into the system, meeting the standards that we've put in place. I do know that we had a lot of challenges with that at Starbucks when we went live. Um, Debbie, Avinash, were you around? Were either of you heavily involved in getting the data into the system when we initially went live and the challenges that we faced with that? Oh, yes, most definitely. Any um, advice for Cheryl or, or lessons learned that you could go back and do differently, you would? Cheryl, any questions? <laughs> um. Well, let me, let me say that we had data in multiple different systems um, and we took that data and kind of cobbled it together and put it into the system. And we spent a lot of time cleaning data um, and we're still cleaning data. So um, I would say just, um, you know, you, got, you have to have people that are really paying close attention uh, and it's a, an iterative process for cleaning data. It's a, a never, never ending because things, at least things in our company change and we need to um, add attributes or um, add nodes to our hierarchy. And so it impacts what we, what the data that we have in the system. Amanash, would you have any other advice? No, I think that we, I think you, you kind of, uh, put it really well like the only advice i would give is like what i think what debbie's team is doing is having a data governance process in place so as we are uploading data into the platform again as debbie mentioned this was all new um so we had to kind of cobble together various sources of data so from a tech perspective there were a lot of different transformations that the data went through um and then the, the shape that we are in right now and what Debbie's team does is kind of very laser focused on certain aspects of data. Uh, so we kind of have 
the hierarchies as one data set. So we have a very focused discussion on the hierarchies or the attribution. So having that kind of a structure really helps kind of minimizing the, the risk. And even if we run into certain issues, we do have structures in place to mitigate those or just kind of document those as, as a risk or as something that we will solve for um, with further discussion. So that's the only advice I would give is just having um, structures and folks and, and uh, teams in place that are looking at um, those data sets and se segregating those data sets with a very focused view on, on that particular data set and not taking up everything in, in one go. Right, and I, I think we also, we stood up a data governance process. We have an intake form for um, uh, partners throughout the company to uh, request attributes to be added to um, the data. We have uh, changes for EPH. And so we have a, we have a um, intake review committee uh, comprised of uh, technology partners, um, the business, our team, um, and some additional partners throughout the company. And then we also have a decision forum. So the decision forum team will review things that we've, we've received from an intake perspective. We've reviewed and approved to go forward to the decision forum committee, which that's the same uh, group of people plus uh, finance partners and our um, information architects, our taxonomists. Um, and so we, you know, review, we discuss, oh, and our, and our business intelligence reporting team is also um, participants in that. And um, we'll review those and discuss any um, potential issues or who else we might need to talk with. And depending on what the issue is, we'll either approve it to go forward and then a JIRA story will be created and it'll be worked through um, development and you know, testing and all those pieces before it's put into production. And um, for some um, certain pieces, we have an escalation of approval. So um, if we want to add um, a different uh, node to a level of our hierarchy, it actually goes to the VP. Um, RVP for approval. And um, if we want to change it up entirely, let's just say we decided to sell something that is entirely different from any other product that we have, and we need to create a new product type. Let's just say for, you know, an example, we decide to sell automobiles, then that type of um, approval is going to go all the way up to the CFO. And generally, it's already been approved and, you know, it comes back down. But um, we have a, a whole formal process around it. So um, we also have a, a newsletter that we send out to all the, the users of the system that we put together monthly to keep everyone informed. Um, and we're just keep, keep um, adding things. So that's one of the reasons why I really wanted to be here today was to listen to Sean and Allison and, and learn whatever, uh, what other companies are doing and something else that we might um, take on to be best in class. So yeah, thank you. Thank you guys yeah. so much. Cheryl, any questions or any thoughts on that? I do have a question. How many uh, product records are you maintaining and with how many staff? Roughly. You mean the, the number of products in the system, Cheryl? Yes. Oh, gosh. I think we have about 30,000 records in the system. Avinash, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and we have a, um, my team is myself and, and two partners from uh, the business side of the house and operations, if you will. And then we have a, you know, a, an entire group of technology partners that um, work on the system as well. So um, it's, the operation side is a small but mighty group. <laughs> I appreciate that. We yeah. have 1.3 million records and a staff of three. <laughs> okay, well, I feel, I feel pretty good about my space. <laughs>
I think that might be a good time to pivot because on that note, Cheryl, and I know Debbie and Avinash, we were talking about the challenge of this last week is oftentimes the need for more resourcing and more buy-in around data governance and the importance of it when you're managing 1.5 million records or, or 30,000 with ongoing requests from different groups to add more data can be a challenge. So Sean, I know you have some thoughts and in some slides, I believe, around that topic. So well, I was just gonna yeah pull up. Um, so so we get this a lot. That um, this is a Gartner slide that's been around for kind of a long time. And the problem is, I think it was Avinash you said, or one of you guys said that you know we we're really working to clean up data, and you know the data isn't very good. But what Gartner would tell you is that if, without governance put in place then the, the dip in the trust of the data is going to degrade and master data is going to degrade at 2 to 7% per month. So whether it's a PIM implementation, MDM implementation, or an S4 transformation or whatever, companies spend a lot of time and a lot of money trying to get their data good, but they don't have anything in place. I mean, so at this point, they're going on a diet, frankly. <laughs> We're going on a diet. We've got a wedding to go to. Uh, we need to look good. Um, after that, we're not on a diet anymore. So I tell people all the time, it's a lifestyle, not a diet, but we got to implement processes to eliminate that debt. That, you know, we don't want that um, technical, that data debt that's going to happen. So um, this is a, an example from a customer that I was working with where they were having a significant problem with the degradation of data in their system. You know, who has it, who owns it, and that sort of thing. So I don't know if this resonates. I can send this out to you guys um, after the call, but it's pretty powerful. Executives are like, oh yeah, I mean, it seems like every project we have, we you know get going and it's everything is pretty good and then you know, the data crashes. Um, and just to level set, what we find is that for successful um, programs, and I've done a lot of different data programs, people are always like, oh, but we bought this great tool. And I'm like, you know, that's nice, but I could, I could buy, you know, um, Roy McElroy's golf clubs, that doesn't make me, <laughs> you know, second in the British Open or third or whatever we ended up with, right? I mean, it's really the components that go around, um, around that. Um, so the framework is really kind of how we're going to manage the data. It really ensures um, how we're going to use it, how we're going to structure it. Are we going to have catalog? Are we going to have glossary? Are we going to have standards and rules and how we're going to put all that together? Um, but the key is that you know, we find that it's helpful and most successful to connect that to value drivers in the company. So what are we doing? Why? How are we doing it? What's the focus of the data program in that? The next thing is the operating model. It sounds like um, maybe Debbie, you guys have a pretty decent opera operating model in place because that's the, the processes around data, but it's also who owns it, who's the stewards, what are, what are the, uh, the racy, um, if you will for each of the different elements of who's on, you know, if I'm a steward, if I'm a maintainer, if I'm a, an analyst, if I am on one of these committee, what's my role and responsibility? What does a data owner do? Who has decision rights to say this is important or not important? Um, so it's kind of the people organization and the process around what we're trying to do with data. The third component is really a decision tree. You know, I hear you guys talk about, you know, adding data, adding attributes, adding different things. Um, well, depending on the flavor of the month, people are going to want to add different things. And it's usually a, um, an emotional type of discussion. If you have five people, you're probably going to get five different um, answers as to what the next critical data is. But really having a um, repeatable process around what data is critical, what does that mean, um, so that we can identify where to focus from a data program perspective. And then the last thing is really a measurement framework. And you can think of this in terms of the quality of the data, right? Is my, do I have the consistency, you know, all of the, the C's around the data. But beyond that, these metrics need to be linked to, uh, to business metrics. Um, and the more mature organizations um, will tend to link their data governance processes and metrics to the functional owners. So I tell people all the time, you know, leading data programs, I mean, go talk to finance, go talk to supply chain, go talk to the different people in your organization because their objectives should be your objectives. And you need to be able to tie your work to their work to make sure that you're successful. So then it's not of, uh, you know, what have you done for me lately? But the organization has visibility. You're on the same team with them because, you know, data governance, who wants to be governed? Terrible term, everything about <laughs> whoever started this did, a, did nobody any favors with stewards and governance and all of this language. So, um, so linking data to uh, the organization is really important. So when I talk about the framework 
I mean, you can go top down, bottom up, um, you know, you've got business programs and goals. So what are you trying to accomplish with that? How are the metrics in place? Um, I talked about the framework, right? I mean, it's the processes and the rules and the standards around that. And then, you know, catalog is wonderful. And I've had, I've been to companies where they've got, you know, hundreds of thousands of things, fields and uh, tables in their data catalog. And I'm like, so what, what are we going to do with that? I mean, until you can add some business context, some metadata around that um, business language around what it is, and then tie rules to the critical data, it's a bit of a challenge. So, um, you know, when we talk about operating models, again, Debbie, it sounds like you have some of this, or maybe a lot of this, where, you know, these are the artifacts, this is how you request something, or if you've got a report and we don't know what's going on. So operating models are, are critical to add. Organizational model, who does what, when do they do it, how often do they need to be involved? So, you know, typical activities of a steward, for example, and that kind of thing. And then um, I talked about the decision tree. You know, we need to decide um, what do we govern, how do we govern it, where should we govern it, who should govern it, and ultimately to drive the result that the business needs. So I like to tell people that, you know, it's kind of like crossing the street, right? I mean, the safest way for me to cross the street is get to the curb, look both ways, take one step, look both ways, take one step, look both ways. I mean, that's a problem. That's going to take me a week to cross the street and I might get hit. So with our governance processes, they can't be so rigid that we stop the business. Um, so in a, in another example of that is Amazon will let me enter all kinds of stuff that may or may not be correct. But when it gets down to my address, they're going to say, do not pass go, do not stop. Uh, that is incorrect, right? And so in the business terms, we need to make sure that we have the right governance. So the right governance for crossing the street is probably I look both ways, maybe halfway through if I'm in New York City, I look again, otherwise you just go, right? Um, and then we need to capture how do we govern it? So is it, like I described, is it instantiated within a system? Um, so as they're typing in the information, they get, you know, it's gotta be this specific thing, it's gotta be in this particular format, all of the great things about data quality. Um, where do we govern that? Is that all the way back in the, you know, the, the origin of the data in the original process? Or is it, you know, just something that we've got to report on a monthly basis kind of thing? And so we're just going to run a report. Um, who should govern that? Again, to ultimately drive the result. When we talk about who, um, Debbie, you're correct. I mean, it's, there's structures that get put in place. Uh, people have decision rights, and um, we need to make sure that whoever is going to feel a lot of the pain, if it's not correct, is a part of that governance process. So uh, and then I talked about the metrics model where, you know, you got to look at business impact. I mean, at the highest point, um, these are the more mature organizations that can tie what they're doing from, uh, you know, how many products are we adding to the PIM? How many you know things are we um entering how many critical data elements are we governing? I mean, th those are all nice, um, but, you know, until we kind of move up that curve and tying the work that we do to business impact, um, you know, we're going to struggle with that. So, yeah, I mean, I just kind of wanted to make sure, I, I don't know if that's helpful or th that's kind of our core, what we do and what we find. I mean, I was at a company last, well, last week, today. it was Monday, <laughs> I traveled and was with the company and they're actually pretty mature with their PIM and what they do and, and, act, and a leader in the CPG industry as far as, you know, what they're able to publish. Um, you know, they get a lot of, anyway, they're doing really well, but some of these blocking and tackling things, they just don't have in place. Um, and they're like, we need to do this. We need standards and rules. We need policies and we need people that own stuff. And, and so they've come pretty far on their, their PIM journey and their data quality journey but they struggle with some of the basics. And um, so they were kind of excited, <laughs> frankly, to understand what some of those basics were. So I don't know if that's um, helpful or if you guys have then questions around that. I thought that was very helpful. Thank you, Sean. Could you um, share those slides? That would be awesome. Yeah, no problemo. Perfect, thank you. So you, had, you do have a lot of these things in place, Debbie, it sounds like. Yeah, we have a few of them in place, but um, I think we can make it more robust. And um, when we met um, last week with the team, uh, we talked about a center of excellence and um, executive sponsorship. And we um, so we we had some conversation about that uh, this week. And and I think just having some. Uh, I love that slide where it says data. Uh, I wrote it down, master data degrades. Yeah. 7% 
per month, all caps. Um, I think that's a very powerful message. So, yeah. Yeah, and there's other statistics I can help you with where, you know, the, the, the cost of a bad item getting in the system is ridiculous. I mean, I can't think of it off the top of my head, but it's it's twelve or sixteen thousand dollars ish is what they say for every bad piece of data that gets in. So, so we do have some slides material. Maybe I could shoot you, Debbie, that kind of also helps kind of quantify. Here's what we're hearing from leaders. Here's what we're seeing from leaders, and kind of the cost as well as the benefit. Like if we do this, so what? Well, you're faster at implementing um, programs and projects. Transformation goes faster. So those types of things we can help you out with as well. Thank you. Sean, I did have one question. So looking at this, I uh, wanted to understand, so uh, like from a platform standpoint and from just from a technology uh, perspective, like when you are kind of putting these uh, processes together and the governance processes, um, does, it, um, does it make sense to kind of segregate this based on geographies or countries or things like that? Because one of the challenges that we are kind of working through right now is um, going through the like, internationalization or because from a from PIM and product data standpoint, every region has their own nuances. Yeah. Uh, like even within the US, let's say we if we want to make sure that there are multiple channels and they want to see the product data in various forms, like what are some of the best practices or what are some of the thoughts that that you had for managing that complexity is how do you segregate between these different regions or different versions of the same product? And what are some of the governance structures that might help in, in that aspect of it? Yeah, that's a really good question. And it does happen to all of our you know, bigger customers. Um, so there's, there's no silver bullet and there are absolutely positively local rules and local needs that need to be established. And you know, the first thing is to identify those um, needs, make sure that they are unique enough because, you know, I tell people all the time, you're special, you're not that special. <laughs> so, but there are some things um, that, that absolutely need to be unique to a given uh, geography, product line, you know, what have you. Um, but, you know, do we know what those are? Have we documented them? Do we have standards and rules around that? And when I talk about standards and rules, just to clarify, like, like a standard would be that all roads have to have speed limits. That's a standard. So a lot of people have, you know, policies and standards around vendors, around products, around claims, around, you know, different things. But then how those get implemented in a given geography, um, product line or whatever, those are going to be rules. And rules are applied to specific tables and fields because the same, um, I mean, you could have vendor in 15 different systems and you could have 15 different, you know, one's alphanumeric, one's eight characters, one's, you know, whatever. I mean, there's a lot of different things going on, but, um, but you need to understand what those are, identify those are, and, and build out your processes with that. So unfortunately, there's, you know, no silver bullet. There's always going to be uniqueness. I mean, even around, you know, what you can call cashews and I mean all of the claims around the world are quite a bit different as I'm sure you guys are well aware um, so it's capturing them and, and making sure that you implement them per the process that's required again as simple as you can make it but knowing that there's just going to be um, customization or uh, very specific needs so Sean building on your analogy of road standards are all roads have to have a speed limit would the rules be the speed limit for that specific road so for an Avinash's example, do we find that standards tend to be more common along geographies and the rules tend to be more nuanced or is it really just dependent on everything? Standards tend to be more, uh, more enterprise level, actually. Right. So in North America, I mean, every road's got to have a speed limit. In the state of Missouri, the speed limit on interstates is 70 miles per hour. The school zones are 20 miles per hour. But very specifically, the road you know, outside my house is this particular road. So think of that as the table and field. That specific road is this speed. So then, Avinash, I think at the, the enterprise level, we're really trying to align on those standards. And then we're going to have to work within the system to allow for the rules to be more nuanced on the geographical uh, level. Does that make sense? That makes sense, yeah. And, and I don't know if, if you had any good examples that you can provide maybe later on that... Um, I mean, understanding like what you just mentioned, Sean, I think that's 
kind of exactly like our thought process, like yeah, going in and understanding the business, understanding the data, understanding like what's exactly required. So yeah, I mean, all of those. And again, as you mentioned, there's no silver bullets. It really takes a lot of work and time to get to that level. Um, so yeah, I think any, any examples that you can provide maybe uh, later as well would, would be great. And then yeah, we can share out like what we find later. But I think we are on that journey where we are just trying to understand like what it would take for us to um, kind of implement those nuances and especially working with Debbie's team. Uh, we have multiple sales channels in, in North America alone. And then um, again, like with different geographies, there are other challenges. So uh, for us, I think that's kind of the challenge that we are working through right now and would be interested to see like how other organizations have dealt with it or are thinking about it. I think one of the questions that, that I have is in the in for companies that have you know international markets, you know, different business channels, once they've established like the rules, right? Are there separate governance bodies within those markets? And there's like an Uber governance um, kind of like a shared services and then separate, like, let's just say the Europe has a, a governance body, Africa has a governance body, North America has a governance body, and then do they all roll up to one? And what does that look like for other companies that are doing business globally? Yep, that's a great question. Um, so I've worked with uh, a little soda company. <laughs> Um, working for them, you know, to set up, actually I've worked for both Pepsi and Coke in the past two years. So, um, uh, so I would tell you it absolutely depends. It depends on the appetite of the organization. It depends on um, the type of people you have in those organizations. But so for Pepsi, for example, they um, brought in a chief data officer. They brought in a VP of data governance. There are some centralized functions, but there are absolutely positively um, stewards out in, um, you know, in the enterprise, and they do it by domain for the most part. Um, they, I would say they have working councils at the regional level, but those working councils work with the enterprise level data team. Um, some companies are, uh, you know, the, the thing is, is that a lot of times you have to centralize to get some of these things going to build that organizational muscle and start to train the organization before you can kind of start to get things out in the enterprise. And it's a little bit of a balance because how are you going to get buy-in for, for the, you know, for the work that needs to be done. Um, but so what we usually do is we come in and we kind of evaluate what, you know, of the models that we have, whether it's fully centralized, a federated model or fully decentralized, that's kind of the, the range of things that we, um, recommend uh, just sort of depends on the particular enterprise and um, you know where their strength. And Sean, like as you were explaining, so like is my understanding right? Like you start with something like with a very centralized model because that's where you're kind of building the system, making sure all the quality and the rules are there as much as you could in that platform. And then, like, do you then recommend? slowly transitioning to a federated and then to a decentralized model or do you still keep that centralized model throughout the life cycle or like during the operations phase of it like once you're kind of stable and then you're implement like you you kind of have gone live and stable for a while so yeah again it depends on the organization but we you know put together kind of a crawl walk run for people <laughs> um so it sort of depends i mean the only caution i would say is that if there are extreme um, uniquenesses that as you're building, you, you need to build those in. Um, so I'm sure that you guys have gotten input from the various regions, countries, uh, whether it's industries or product lines. Um, you know, you have to get that input when you're building it to make sure you have the capability to support what their requirements are gonna be. But, you know, you, you have to get everybody on board. And I, I would guess that your CEO is one of these people that says we are going to be a data-driven company because um, that is a huge uh, and important um, aspect of it. With I worked with Maersk Line. You've probably seen the small container ship company. Actually, they're the largest in the world. They're about twice as big as everyone else. 
I set up their entire, I lived in Copenhagen for three years, set up their entire team. And what ended up happening is the CEO actually had a plaque on his desk that said, in God, we trust everyone else bring data. So we really did have the support from the top down to make the transition. Um, and so I, I, I would guess that uh, Starbucks has similar um, type of support from the top in order to um, get some influence over the regions and the teams that are kind of far flung. But there is definitely a crawl, walk, run. I mean, I mean, not only where you get the, the input and who's making the requests and who's kind of managing and working governance, you know, it initially starts with people that are very data focused. It could be data stewards, people that have been assigned to this particular project. But over time, the demand like you guys are talking about where people are like, oh, wow, this is what we do. This is the benefit that we're going to get. Then the, the requests and the processes will change because now more of the organization understands more. They, they, want, they want actually more kind of ownership. I think there's always a need to have uh, a centralized uh, focus. Um, most large organizations, frankly, have a you know, chief data officer under there, have some kind of um, data governance um, organization with them. But as they get more mature, you can push things out um, to the region, but always in coordination. Sean, I think I have seen in my experience the most resistance to the centralized model when individual regions or individual groups are entirely responsible for their own P&L and they have their own ways of doing things. And they think that if adopting this centralized governance and way of doing things is going to affect their ability to hit their margins or sell as many products. Is that something you've seen in your experience as well? Well, you got to be able to move at the right pace. It's kind of like saying, hey, I want you to you know, look both ways every single step when you cross the street, you'll probably get a little resistance to that. You know, so the, the, the balance or the art of it is figuring out what's going to work for them. And again, tying the work that we do with their objectives. I mean, your SLAs can't get longer. You know, I mean, if it takes me, you know, whatever, three months to set up a new product, for example, you can't, it can't now be six months. I mean, that doesn't work. You're going to get a little bit of resistance to that. Um, so we have to do better, faster, you know, it's got, it's got to be an improvement for people and they have to, you know, I mean, change management, right? Just get people involved, listen to them, <laughs> nod your head, um, and then get them to think in a different way and participate. It's, I'm not saying it's easy for sure. Absolutely. Um, Ruthie, Cheryl, any questions, uh, from, from you guys? I, I know that we've been, uh, <laughs> talking to Debbie and Avinash quite a lot. So I want to make sure that we I'm curious, Cheryl, if you're, um, or maybe it was Ruthie, your, your challenge is, um, you're with uh, Volvo, right? Cheryl. Cheryl is. So um, are those mostly, is it asset management or are those products? Parts. Parts. Aftermarket yeah. parts. Yeah. Yep. So, I mean, our, our challenge is, you know, we have a lot of data, 1.3 million records coming out of le old legacy systems. Yep. Um, you know, my goal is just to get that baseline and then obviously improve it going forward and, you know, switch from legacy data to master data system. Um, and yeah, so I'm just, I'm listening, a lot of good ideas or, you know, going through my head, I just have to get there because I'm a big believer in data governance and I'm definitely going to be pioneering it in our organization. So absolutely, I'm going to need all the ammunition I can get. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. You know, I mean, one of the things I say is people, I mean, it's kind of rules before tools and, and I'm sure our precisely sales teams don't like it when we say that. I mean, you know, it is kind of rules before tools. And, and, and so we encourage people to um, think about, kind of the four things that I described. And, and one of those has, has to do with, you know, the tool side of it. But thinking about, you know, again, not the diet, the lifestyle, how are we going to get people involved and how are we going to make sure that we have, you know, ongoing, we just keep getting better and better. And I will say, I think at, at Volvo, we have moved into kind of an agile iterative development cycle and Avinash Debbie, I know we've seen significant success with that at Starbucks, which does allow us to continue to iterate on data sets, on functions and features within the platform and evolve to the business's needs. So I do think that has helped a lot at Starbucks with getting more people involved 
And like I said, allowing for that continuous improvement. Um, Debbie Avinash, do you guys agree? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and and kind of within uh, our organization, yeah, I mean that's that's the one that we. I mean that's one of the ways that we are kind of trying to align with the mindset of like agile and doing iteration. So like even if we are introducing certain new data sets, again it's uh, new concepts um, and going through different iterations kind of definitely gives us a lot of learnings. And I think that's something that we are still you know working on and trying to implement just to kind of adopt to and align to that. Uh, agile framework. Absolutely. All right, and Ruthie, I'm going to put you on the spot as well, and just uh, I'd love to know if, if you have any additional questions, if you'd like Sean or myself to dive into anything deeper, or Cheryl or Debbie or Avinash. Um, anything? Um, I have no questions right now. Um, okay. Some of our biggest struggles have to do with just system speed at this point, so. Um, no questions right now. Absolutely. All right. We have a lot few a lot. Um, we have less like less than eight thousand product records that we're dealing with. So we we're not in the huge product range like a lot of you folks are. So. And I don't want to get too technical because I'm not the technical person. But in terms of your mm -hmm. processing speeds, is it with loading data? Is it applying business rules? What do you find is really slowing your system down with, with candidly so few records in comparison to Cheryl over it at Volvo Mac Trucks? Right. Um, well, we're not exactly sure. So that's um, something we're going to be diving into here. We just did um, the latest upgrade on our um, testing system. So we're hoping to move that to live um, within another week or two. Um, and then that, I guess we're going to be addressing the speed issues because it's, we know it's not where it's supposed to be because 8,000 records is next to nothing, right? <laughs> so, right. Yeah. We do have a lot of business rules. Some of them are complex. Um, we have a lot of a, a kind of a very complex workflow, so. Okay, and I know Cheryl's also experiencing some challenges with uh, data load times, but in the 1.3 million records <laughs> range, it's a little more understandable. Yeah, and even just importing, um, you know, new, new parts, we're running into some issues and again and we also have a lot of business rules and complex workflows um but you know precisely has been really helpful in troubleshooting some of those issues alongside with amplify so absolutely um you know it's it's worth having the technical folks that are really smart about databases and indexes take a to audit it. Absolutely. Not the Allisons of the world, <laughs> but definitely that. No that. offense. <laughs> yeah, no. Hey, you don't want me auditing your technical system. I will uh, smile and get much smarter people on the phone, but that's my, my skill set when it comes to the technical things. I bring, I'll bring Chris Collier to the calls, right, Avinash, Debbie? <laughs> but I know where I have my strengths, so. Uh, Ruthie, I will have Tracy and team follow up with you because I'm sure if there's anything we or Suzanne and, and Sean on the Precisely side can do to help you dig into those issues with load times, uh, we would be more than happy to do so. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Awesome. And I know we are coming up on time. So any last words of wisdom or thoughts or anything that you want to get across to the team, uh, Sean or anyone on the call? I mean, not from my side. I mean, there's a lot of good information out there and, and you know, we do a ton of business in the CPG space. So if you guys, um, you know, want to connect, there's, I know we did a webinar with General Mills, for example. Um, they've come a long, long way in their journey from, you know, not really having any kind of governance to pretty advanced, pretty integrated with, uh, with leadership, um, aligned objectives and that sort of thing. So if you guys have any of those needs, let me know. Awesome. All right. 
thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, I will be sending out a recording of this uh, boardroom so that everybody can like refer back to anything that was said that may have, you know, been really helpful for them or uh, to take to any of your leadership to help gain that uh, data governance buy-in. Um, so thank you for joining and uh, we'll be in touch. Have a great day. Thanks, Sean. Thank you all. Awesome. Thanks so, Thank you much. so much for participating. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye.